Hey, hey, good morning, Gateway. Welcome. If you're watching online, thanks for tuning in this morning. What a joy to be together and sing some hymns together, some classics. Wow. When was the last time we sang some of those? Like since we were little kids, probably, huh? Hey, joining me on the stage and then up on the big screen is uh, some of our stewardship council. Uh, three, I think, are out, out on vacation all, all across the United States, wherever they are, but three are here with uh, me today. And uh, as we are in this series, the summer series, This Is Us, we wanted to invite people to the stage and introduce you to some very important folks that help us uh, do church as a team. Uh, Mark Hubbard, uh, Lenise Frank, and Alan Hopkins are some of those, along with those uh, on the screen, uh, the Buffs and Richard Clausen and uh, Troy Gregg. And we thought that uh, just for a moment, we would uh, pull back the curtain. Uh, this is one of the things about us as a church is that we're full disclosure. We're transparent. We want you to know uh, what's happening in the books. And uh, we have some exciting numbers to share. And so standing with me today, I appreciate this team. And uh, we want to put a couple slides up on the screen and have you rejoice with us. Because uh, in the first six months of this year, so January through June, this is our mid-year quick update. Look how much you gave to missions in the first half of the year. $23,000. So... Bravo. Thank you for uh, giving to Global Missions. But we also are uh, touching our community, local outreaches like Union Gospel Mission and Hope Pregnancy Center, YWAM, uh, Disaster Relief, Chaplaincy, uh, Salem Leadership Foundation, the, the middle school right around the corner. So, so many different ways that we are investing both globally and locally. Around here, we call it No Grow Go, and uh, we want to do that with our neighbors, but also across borders. And so, excited to, to share with you some of the ways that uh, you've been generous. Now, uh, another one that we're kind of working on as a council is how do we get that mortgage? Uh, when we first bought this, this campus uh, about 13 years ago, uh, we purchased it for over a million dollars, and now we're down to $390,000 remaining on our balance. And so we wanted to let you know that's where we're at, and we're still chunking, chipping away. And uh, we look forward to rejoicing with uh, getting this, this place paid off. As you met some of our other folks that are meeting in the building, we have uh, the Cross Creek Community Church that meets in, in the building, and then we're looking at some other par partnerships uh, this fall to be using the facilities. But uh, what, a, what a delight to be able to share how our mortgage is going down. All right, also want to just let you in on a little bit of the scoop. Many of you don't know this information, but uh, a couple times a year we want to share that our budget is $32,000, $33,000 a month. That's our operating budget. And uh, we're, in, we're in a year where our theme is overflow. Now take a look at it. If you just see the numbers, this is good math. Monthly income average over $44,000 and monthly expense average is 43. That's good math. When, when God is overflowing his goodness and our, our income is above our expenses. Anybody want that in your households? Uh, yeah, I want it in my household too. But we're, we're grateful for the, the wisdom, the leadership, the stewardship of, uh, of this team. And uh, we meet uh, once a month to go over numbers and to dream and strategize. And so because of some of these new numbers and some of these new averages, the second half of 2022, we will be strategizing uh, on some new numbers and some new vision and some new direction. But thank you for your generosity. And uh, man, we thank you, Lord, for your overflow because uh, you're pouring out in some amazing ways. So can uh, you give uh, one last uh, clap for our, our stewardship council? Thanks for, for joining me uh, th this morning. All right, as we keep going with a little family business, the kids and the youth will be in for just a few more moments. Uh, I want to invite uh, up to the stage in just a second our pastoral team, our serve team. But uh, take a look at some of these uh, announcements via video this morning. If you're watching online, tune into this. Okay, we hope you enjoyed worship this morning. My name is Greg, this is McKenna, and we're going to do some video announcements today. That's right. Good morning. We're so glad you're joining us. Hey, we got tons going on, so please check out our website. We've got all sorts of details on there, but just a few things we wanted to communicate. Um, on Wednesday, July 20th at 6.30 p.m., we're going to be having a women's worship night at the Buffs House at the River. And so if you need more details, please uh, personal message us on Instagram or email the church for the, the address for that. And then Friday, fun night. Yeah. Friday, fun night. And we're going to be throwing corn holes Let's all go. over the place. Uh, we got a tournament. we got uh, pulled pork, coleslaw, and delicious food. So bring your family and friends, your kids, your neighbors out for the fun night uh, this Friday, July 22nd at six o'clock. Anything else happening? Yeah, at that fa family fun night, we are gonna be having water games. So for your kiddos, make sure that they wear their swimsuits or shorts and a t-shirt, um, that way we can have some water games. I'm Greg, that's McKenna. Those are your announcements for today. God bless you. Tune into the word. All right. Tune into the word. 
Uh, so we're tuning into the Word in a little bit of a different format. Uh, during the series, This Is Us, we've been inviting different people to the stage, and I wanted to introduce to you uh, my wife, Stacy, who will be celebrating 34 years in two weeks, and uh, we're going strong. And uh, my good friend, Daryl Borello, uh, and Lynn Morellis, and Aaron Morellis. And uh, these folks have helped me uh, experience some sanity, and uh, I'm grateful for who they are, the variety of gifts, the variety of skills and talents uh, and heart. We here uh, represent uh, the serve team or the pastoral team, and uh, I wanted you to be able to see them so that you can go to them, call them, email them, us. We are here to serve you, and the five of us want to just have a quick little chat about our text today. You can try to get there real quick. We're going to be in the good book of Ephesians in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church there in Ephesus. We'll have these verses up on the screen. This group's going to help me read those. I'll start with verse 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then uh, we'll finish these, these six verses, and then uh, we'll have some chat about it, and then, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have, then we'll let the youth and the kids go, and then I'm going to preach about it, and then we'll let all you go. So that's the plan for today. Sound good? It will be out around 2 o'clock. Yeah, so we should be out by... <laughs> By early dinner, I yes, think, probably, probably, probably will, will be good. All right, join me as we read the, today's passage, the Holy Scriptures, uh, in Ephesians 4, verse 11. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their, I'm sorry, I can't read it back there. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, Come the on. body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. And our last verse today, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This serves as our passage today, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, uh, robust, loaded. So much is in here, and I thought we'd have a, a little chat, but would you join me as we pray today? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus, that makes our souls well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we um, count it a great privilege to exalt you because you are holy. So we thank you for this day. We ask that uh, the words would leap off the page, and there would be something for us to uh, learn new, but to exercise and to put into practice uh, afresh for our lives. Thank you for this team and for all of us that are here today, watching, listening. Uh, we are grateful that we could be here on this July day to, uh, to lean in and learn more from you. So we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Some people think that the church um, is like a pyramid. And that pyramid, the pastor is somewhere on that pyramid. Some would say top, some would say corner, or some would say bottom. Others would say that the church is like a bus. And the pastor is the bus driver. And all the passengers are just passively sitting in the bus, just hoping that the bus driver is getting to a good direction. <laughs> I would submit to you today that it's not a pyramid and it's not a bus. It's something very different. We just read about it. That we are a body, we are a team, we are a group of people where all joint supplies. And this morning, uh, just to help kind of illustrate that, I thought that you would be able to hear from some of your pastors today as uh, we're in this together, trying to uh, navigate post-pandemic leadership and uh, moving forward uh, in, in some new fresh ways. And Stace, we've been kind of living this out a little bit and uh, you, you, you've... You've helped me and helped us to implement this passage. Uh, what are some of your thoughts and observations from Ephesians chapter 4? Uh, my role here at Gateway is discipleship. And so I've been studying intently about discipleship and what that looks like. And that included uh, the doctoral dissertation of a friend of mine, Dr. Tammy Donahue, uh, did her whole thesis project on discipleship and what does it look like in the church and she a part of her uh, realizations in her study was how important it is to have a solid pastoral leadership team 
that the healthiest uh, churches that she saw in all the studies that she did were churches that didn't have just one senior leader, that, that everything funneled to him, all, all decisions went through him, that everything was, was him and top down, but that it was spread out on the shoulders of a pastoral team. So we got a hold of that research and really started praying through that. And I mean, we already somewhat operated in this manner because of the gifting that you, you see before you. Um, we, we've worked well as a team in the past, but in this last year, we've expanded it and put more uh, weight and an emphasis on the fact that Greg is not the only pastor here. You'll hear him say all the time, I'm one of the guys on the team. Well, here are some of the other folks on the team. This specifically is your pastoral team. And it has re revolutionized our leadership. It's brought life to our leadership. It has uh, empowered, I think, and released the five of us to operate fully and how God has wired us to, to serve. And it's, it's been a real joy in this last season to expand this pastoral leadership team. Yeah. So we meet, we meet each week to pray, to encourage, to strategize, to vision cast, to believe and pray uh, for some of the needs that many of you have, and uh, really to walk alongside our staff and our stewardship council to say, how can we continue to know, grow, and go? How can we continue to live out this uh, Ephesians 4 model of a, a team effort? And so uh, I wanted to read you some, some Barna research. He's, uh, Barna does research on, on theology and on pastors and on churches. And recently they found that 43% of pastors want to quit compared with 29% in January of 2021. Um, more than 4,000 churches closed in America in 2020. And over that same time, over 20,000 pastors left the ministry. And 50% of current pastors say they would leave the ministry if they had another way of making a living. The great resignation plaguing our nation is reaching into churches on an alarming level. And this is one of the reasons why Gateway has created a different, fresh approach to be able to have us all stay sane and have us all be able to help, to help shepherd well yeah. into this last season. Uh, it's no longer the day where you make uh, 100 decisions in a month. Now we're making uh, pretty much 100 decisions a day sometimes. And during the pandemic, at the heat, height of it, uh, we were making a lot of de decisions. And we have decision um, Fatigue, and we just get a little bit tired with all the different things that are happening. So this great group is helping uh, us do that. And uh, Daryl, some of the things that uh, you know we just read in Ephesians chapter four about equipping uh, the saints to do the work of the ministry. Uh, you also are partnering with discipleship, growing purposely. What, what does it look like for us to equip the saints, this dear group of people, for the work of the ministry? Yeah, to me, it's it's threefold. So it's creating a culture and an atmosphere here at Gateway where every person in this sanctuary has the ability to serve one another in love, um, express and manifest their spiritual gifts, and teach and disciple, because that's what the Great Commission is. It wasn't yeah. directed to pastors. It was directed toward Christ followers. Yeah. So we all have that same role. And, and the, the neat thing about um, Ephesians 4 is when he says equipped for the work of ministry, that's not an academic work. That's a serving one another yeah. work. It's a labor. And so to create a culture here where we're all serving each other in love, we're all spurring each other on towards spiritual maturity and a closer relationship with Jesus, and we're all able to, to use our, our spiritual gifts. If we can get to that point, yeah. then the church flourishes, the Great Commission works, and the kingdom comes to heaven. Yeah, yeah well, well said. Because, look, we're, we're up here uh, alongside of you. Uh, we are here to serve. And that, that's a, a very important thing. Lynn, you've been in ministry for over 40 years. I, I don't mean to age you, or, uh, but in she's, honor she's of, 41. of uh, the maturity so I. and the matriarchal spirit that you carry, um, what, what are you hearing from the spirit as we are leading forward in, in a post-pandemic season and, and a, as a team and, and what the Holy Spirit is saying to you and to us as a church? Okay, I actually was praying over this last night and got that for those of you who have been in the church for over 40 years, like I have, we went through the tumultuous season of the 60s, and out of that came this incredible revival of the Jesus movement, which a lot of us were saved in and a lot of us were participants in. I feel like our world right now looks like the 60s all over again. 
It's, it's new, it's brand new, but it's tumultuous right now. And I am honestly believing that God is going to bring a new revival, a fresh wind blowing through, and he's going to use us. Good. And I believe that equipping the saints for the works of ministry is what Ephesians 4 is talking yeah. about. That means every one of you in the room is a minister. We're not ministers. We're just here as like cheerleaders. I mean, our goal is to equip everyone around us. We are all ministering every place we go and whatever we do. Now, my goal here is outreach. And I believe that's everyday living. I believe that's larger. I believe that's, that's supporting our missionaries overseas who are over ministering. I mean, John and... John Alphonse sent me texts last night of all the pictures at the refugee camp. Yeah, it was just awesome to see all the refugees they're touching. Um, but for right now, the idea is that God's going to blow a new wind through there. For anybody remember the old song that says, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. I feel like this season of life right now says, let there be revival in this world and let it begin with me. Yeah, I hope we can all just put our hands up and say, okay, start with me. I don't have to be 25 for it to start with me. I can be 65 and let it start with me. And whatever you are, God's going to use you in this one too. Yeah. You received that word today? Yeah, that's good. Aaron, talk to us. Of, you know, it says in Scripture that we're uh, the work of the ministry to, to do the, to do the work of the yep. ministry. I mean, we're, we're ministers. You're, we're all ministers. So what's that look like more here at Gateway? Well, I think it, what it looks like is that it looks like we got to get outside the four walls of this church. Paul says in the very beginning of four, it says as a prisoner. So he gives us this idea of where he's writing to the church from. And he's not writing to the bunch of leaders. He's writing to us, all of us uh, this morning. And he says, as a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. It's not just pastors, it's not just teachers, it's not just evangelists that are called. Every single one of us is called to the community in which we live in. And we have to live a life worthy of that calling. Yeah. So the question is, what are we doing within the community that we live in? How are we living as parents? How are we living as grandparents? What are we doing in sowing into the next generation? Uh, if you haven't been a part of the next generation, the things that are being taught within our schools, the things that are uh, being poured into our young people right now is staggering. And it is absolutely against not just, uh, not just opposite or not just on the other side, but it is against the teaching of the word of God. And so church, it's not going to be through pastors and it's not going to be through teachers that are going to get the work done. It is going to be the work of the body of Christ. And Paul says here that we need to have unity and unity comes from maturity. And so church, we need to become mature. Part of the work that we need to do is that we got to get into our word, that we need to be seeking the Lord with everything that we have, asking, where am I supposed to go? What am I called to do? Because he is challenging us this morning. We are being challenged, each one of us. What is the work that God is calling us to? Because that is how Gateway Church is going to be, and us, it is how we are going to reach this community out there is when we actually get out and get moving. Yeah, well said. So this is us, uh, and this is us. And this morning, just to finish up our, our little chat, I wanted to uh, give you a metaphor or a visual illustration uh, so we're all going to attempt to do something, and uh, I need all your help with this. We didn't practice this, but uh, somewhere is a barbell. Yeah. So come on, all five of us. If you're watching online, you're going to lose us for a minute. But uh, Aaron can't just do it by himself. Well, he probably could, but <laughs> this is supposed to illustrate something. No, I need Daryl. Us too? I mean, know that life is heavy. And there's circumstances and there's trials and there's challenges in our life that we, we, we need help lifting stuff. <coughs> now, I want to just illustrate today that between the five of us, uh, all right, somehow to the front there. To the front. And ladies, you got you to gotta touch this too. You're part of this. All right. Mm. You got it, Stace. No. Stace, take it. Me and mom. Ready? No one person really should carry. You might be able to carry for a short time. But to carry the load that God has given us and to carry the, the challenges and the vision and the direction that he has for us as a church, that we want to do this together. Yeah. And, and so we are here, every joint supply, we are here to help lift the burdens. We are here to help serve and come alongside. And though your uh, burdens might be heavy. And you might say to yourself, well, I'm a 500 pound weight. There's, I'm way too high maintenance. There's no way. 
hey, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus is our healer. We believe that he, he can touch us and help us. Yeah. And together, and not just those that are on the stage, but all of us together can help this community yeah. to handle the weight that God has provided and given to us. And so this morning, uh, thank you for being the weight that God's made you to be. But here's the thing. We're to cast our cares and to cast our worries and to cast our weight on him. Because ultimately, you got to hear this theologically. We, on stage, are not the only ones to carry the weight. In fact, we're really not the best at carrying the weight because Jesus is the ultimate one who went to the cross, sacrificed his life, and bore our sin. He carried the weight on his shoulders. He carried the weight in the nails in his hands and his feet. Is it getting heavy at all yet, guys? Yeah. Don't be too long. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> this, is how we, this is how we get short sermons. But Jesus ultimately carries our weight. You can go to one of us. Yes, we are here. We're called to serve you in the 97306. We are here at Idlewood Campus to serve you. Whether you have kids or you have youth or you're a senior, you're retired, you're a widow, whatever phase, stage of life you're in, we're here to serve you. But here's what we're going to do. We're not going to carry your weight only. We're going to help point you to Jesus who can ultimately carry it. We know that we need Jesus. He is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm grateful for this team, and I'm grateful for many of you. Uh, we have other pastors, leaders, and, and, and amazing people. Uh, Rick, I see Rick, and Mario, and Andrea, and so many other people, uh, Sandy Vandergrift, uh, that, that, are, that are licensed pastors and, and people that have uh, credential. But look, we're all ministers in this together. Right. So can you, uh, can you uh, give them a hand as they uh, pr- figure out what to do with this weight? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, kids, you're going to go with Pastor Lynn, and youth, you're going to go with Pastor Aaron, and uh, you got an exciting time uh, with, uh, with breakouts. And uh, today, if you hadn't heard, it's National Ice Cream Day, so following our service, we'll, we'll be giving you a treat. We got some delicious ice cream out there in the, the backyard. Okay. Would you just turn to your, uh, your neighbor next to you today and, uh, and, and say, equipped to serve, equipped to serve, equipped to serve. Friends, Ephesians 4 is about equipping for something, and that equipping is for serving. And today you're here and possibly you're thinking, well, I I got to church. Isn't that good enough? Like, I'm here. Well, congratulations. That is a big step. You got here. But it's being here to be equipped so you can leave here to be able to serve your nation, your city, your state, your place of work, your kids, your marriage. We are called to serve. Now, what I'd like to do in just the the remaining time uh, that we have today is is teach and preach around Ephesians chapter 4 in these particular verses. Uh, My title this morning is Equipped to Serve. And the text is the good book of Ephesians. These six chapters in Ephesians could be a great homework assignment for this next week. Read a chapter a day and watch how you'll be strengthened and uh, how the enemy will be fleeing and far away. The backdrop is that Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. This is a real life place. Uh, anybody been to Turkey before? Okay, so if you've been to Turkey, then you've been near uh, Ephesus in, is in that area. And uh, Ephesus for many years during the Roman period was considered the second largest populated area of the Roman Empire. The largest being the empire city of Rome. So Ephesus was a big time place in Bible times. In the first century BC, the city had a population of more than Salem. Over 250,000 people were making Ephesus the second largest city known uh, in the world. So this is uh, not just a few people, not just a little village. This is a a pretty large area. And Paul is writing to this area because there's some churches here in Ephesus, home churches, that needed uh, some instruction. Uh, They needed some strategy. They needed some vision. Ephesus is also the first uh, of the seven churches that we read about in Asia Minor. Uh, the city is also believed to be the place where the Apostle John lived, uh, where he, after he wrote the book of Revelation. And uh, tradition would state that John died and is buried in the city of Ephesus. So a lot of history takes place. I'm talking about a real place, Ephesus, uh, during a real time. If you're a note taker this morning and you're kind of wanting to track a little bit about some of the context or the bigger, pictures of, p- bigger picture of Ephesians... Uh, It could be broken down in a simple outline like this. Ephesians 1 through 3 is the calling of the church. Paul's going to give this calling of the church. This amazing thing about predestination and adoption and revelation and salvation. This is an amazing portion of scripture. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. The calling of the church. 
And in the last three uh, chapters, four, five, and six, he's going to talk about the conduct of the church or the application for the church. And herein we lie today in what we've already read in Ephesians chapter 4, some of the application. How do we do this thing called church? How do we do it in 2022? Do we do it different in 22 than they did in the first century? Possibly. Are there some things we can learn from the first century that we can apply in this century? Possibly. So let's just take a look uh, back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. I'll read a couple of these uh, important passages and make some, some uh, observations. And this will lead us to an application for our lives. So when we walk out of here, we've been taught some stuff. We have some new knowledge on board so that we can then live this out wherever we're at. Whether you're on summer vacation, whether you're driving, whether you're working out, whether you're in uh, retirement. Whatever stuff you got going on, you will be able to then apply this today and into this next week. Verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Some would call this a five-fold ministry. These five different gifts. How many have heard this before today when I, we just read it for the very first time? Have you heard of this five-fold ministry, Ephesians chapter 4? Uh, the apostles, pastors, teachers. Okay, good. So if this is new to you, uh, this is uh, pretty exciting because Christ gave, Christ gives, Christ gifts certain leaders and responsibilities and duties to the church. But let me just pause and, and, and ask you a question that I've been asking myself. How do we respond to God's gifts? You might say, well, I respond if I like the gift that he gives. I know with uh, our five kids growing up that uh, Christmas was always pretty special. We try to make, make it special. I remember the year of the, the musical instruments. Each kid got a drum, a guitar, a ukulele, a recorder, or whatever it was. Uh, and we try to make it special. And, and, of course, the kid who got the drum is pretty stoked, but the kid who got the recorder is like, well, that just doesn't really compare. Well, I remember the, the, the year of the bikes where, you know, we try to get all of our kids uh, new bikes. And, and most of them liked them. But then one of the boys was like, well, I don't like that color. This is a lot in, in how we respond sometimes to God's gifts to us. I don't like that color. Ah, I wish I played a different instrument. I wish you would have gotten me something better. I wish you would. Can I just tell you what James says? Every good and perfect gift is from above. And when we have that perspective of where it comes from, then we respond differently to him and to how that gift can be implemented. So let me just remind us in verse 11, as it says, now these are the gifts Paul gave? No. Christ gave. Now these are the gifts that Christ gave and to who? To the church. And, and so I'm just wondering... Do we embrace the gifts that God gives or do we resist the gifts that God gives? Now, Lynn mentioned the 60s and the 60s was a, an incredible time because uh, I, I was born late 60s, so I, I didn't experience this fully. But I remember in, in, my, in my history is that the 60s was a time that you resist leadership. You challenge leadership. You come against leadership. Now, that, that is political and there's some other things that are involved there. Let me get us back into the church. I believe that Christ gives us gifts that we should embrace instead of resist. So I'm not calling us to that rebellious 60s kind of mentality of resist it, don't believe it, check it. For, now, there is room to, 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 to check and to fortify and to make sure that you've got sound, sound leadership. But I just am trying to make the point that these gifts that Christ gives are from Christ. And usually Christ knows what he's giving and it's what we need. And he's given them to the church. So I, I'm the church, and I'm just telling you in front of you right now this morning that I'm grateful that God has given some things, and I'm learning how to embrace those things better. Okay? And, and not that I would favor one over the other, because they're equally good, and they, we need all of them. All right? He gives them to the church. The church of Ephesus obviously needed some leadership. And how good is God to provide it? Now, this is a big town. It was a big place. Second largest. They needed Jesus. They needed the gospel. They needed the good news. And so Christ gives them a 
leadership package. He gives them a strategy to be able to help them do this. Now, fivefold. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, or shepherds, teachers, okay? These are the five. Let me break that down really quick. If you're along for the ride for the first time, in the New Testament, there's basically 25 named apostles, okay? You have 24 men and one woman, Junia or Junius. So you have 25 apostles in the New Testament. Uh, apostles is a, a real deal thing. The reality of that time in Jesus' era and Paul's era is there were, there were apostles, and they, they knew of these apostles, okay? Prophets. Now, I, 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 of course, there's the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the majors and all the minors, but there's 11 mentioned prophets in the New Testament, okay? So 25 apostles, 11 prophets, evangelists. If you, scholars would say there's really only one evangelist. Uh, you, Jesus, we'll give Jesus cred for being an evangelist. But Philip, remember Philip, who, who led the Ethiopian eunuch and got baptized? Philip is kind of the, the one and only known evangelist of the New Testament. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Pastors, this is an interesting note. None are named in the New Testament. And yet we now in 2022 and in this, this century have, have built a leadership structure highly around pastors, shepherds, teachers. But friends, there, there's none really mentioned in the New Testament. Now, I'm not trying to preach heresy or try to mix up your world and, and cause division. But, but let me just try to articulate it this way. In the first century church, they tag team led. They had house churches, Priscilla, Aquila. They had so many different people, Paul, Barnabas, others that would lead together a church. Much of what you saw here with the five of us is kind of our attempt, our approach at an Ephesians 4 model of saying we need to be pastors together and help and lead the charge. But it's interesting to me that in the New Testament, we don't find any pastors. I dare you this week, go find a pastor in the New Testament and then email me or call me, take me out for coffee and let, let's chat about it. And then teachers. Teachers in the New Testament, there's five that are mentioned. Without going into the specifics of who they, they each are, I just wanted to create a framework around how important the apostles are. 25. Prophets, 11. Evangelists, 1. Pastors, none. Teachers, 5. Now, let's break it down a little bit further. Apostles and prophets. They're mentioned together by Paul earlier in Ephesians. If you were to kind of go back to Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, or Ephesians 3, verses 4 and 5, you're going to see this connection or combination, this collaboration of both apostles and prophets. And they're mentioned kind of in the same sentence in the same words, it's in apostles and prophets. They, they were foundational for the church. Uh, can I just go as far to say is it all started with them, okay? Like, how did the church start? Yes, at Pentecost, Holy Spirit breathed, and then they go out. But let me just come back to the disciples. Let's go to Jesus' apostles. It started with them. It's foundational for the church that Christ would give apostles to the church. This is important. Because he would give them apostles to be the foundation of the church. He'd give them revelation so that they would know what to then communicate with the church. This revelation had to be given to them. This is different than evangelists, different than prophets, and different than teachers. You see, the apostles were given the revelation. They became the foundation. Even the apostle Paul, although he was a late comer, had an encounter with Jesus and was considered an apostle of Jesus. So Jesus appeared to them and he commissioned them as apostles. But if we didn't have apostles, we wouldn't have evangelists, pastors, teachers, I'm not saying it in a ranking of priority, but I am saying it in a ranking of importance that without the apostles, the foundation who got the revelation, we wouldn't have, that, that's how it starts. Because once you get the foundation with the revelation, that can then be shared by an evangelist to go out and be able to share that good news. And when the evangelist shares the good news, then you need shepherds, pastors to be able to congregate, collect, and be able to then teach them. You see, it's all sequential and, and wonderful in this God-given orchestrated order, if you will. And the evangelists, the evangelists, they are heralds, they are speakers of this revelation. So the apostles get the foundational truths and the revelation that comes, and then the evangelists learn of that, and then they go spread that. Now, of course, the apostles did as well, but the gift of the evangelist, and evangel means gospel, is to be able to spread the good news. And this is how then the good news of the revelation goes out. 
And the pastors and shepherds, what's their role? Their role is to teach this revelation. I mean, 2 Timothy 4, 2, you see that Paul's saying, look, preach it and teach it. Which, is, since I'm a pastor teacher, that, that's my role, that's my responsibility, that's my job description. I am to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I am to preach and teach the good news. Now, are there moments where I, I'm a apostolic or prophetic? Yes, that, that, that can be true. Some would argue and say, well, the apostles and the prophets were only for the first century. We don't really need them today. And I would argue strongly, as we read here in the text, that it is until Christ return that we'll need all five. And, and so th this is an interesting paradigm. Like, okay, why five? Like, why couldn't you just send us evangelists? Hmm. What would life be like if we just had the evangelists? Or why, why couldn't you just have sent us prophets? God's so good to give us the gift of all. And why does he do this? For the purpose of equipping the saints. Now, on the screen you'll notice in the New Living Translation, but for the New American Standard Version, I like this best, verse 12. What is the purpose that Jesus gives these leaders? Herein lies the answer threefold. Verse 12 in the New American Standard. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Did you get it? There, there's three things right there. They all start with for the, okay? Don't look at the screen. I'm now, I'm looking at New American Standard. I'm in, a, I'm in a different translation, different version. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the people. This is the purpose of these five leaders, to do these three things. Let's talk about it for just a minute, okay? For the equipping of the saints, super important. Without equipped saints, you don't really have an edified or built up church. Now, in, in the original language, equipping uh, could be pictured as a, a fishing net that needed mending. Okay, so a net that needs mending m is equipping. And I think that's a good illustration because really what we're supposed to do as leaders is to come alongside and help broken people mend. And who are these broken people? Now, Paul will say here that the saints uh, are the devoted ones to Christ. And you might say, well, well, how do saints need equipping? Oh, come on. Huh? Come on, saints. You need any equipping? We need daily, hourly, sometimes minute by minute equipping. We need our nets to be mended. We need our nets to be fixed. We need our lives to be uh, paid attention to. And so God's given us leaders to help us do that. Let me just give you four quick ways that leaders should equip. And one of the kind of calls this week to me of a uh, reminder of, wow, am I doing this? How am I doing this? Can, can this be done a little bit better? Ways to equip the saints for the work of the ministry is to be equipped in prayer. This is why Gateway doesn't just have a prayer room during Sunday, but wants to be a praying place every day. To, to be equipped in the scriptures. This is why it's very important for us to know and have the holy book and to be able to be in it on a regular basis. You could read it on Sunday morning off the screen, but I dare you to read it on Monday from your own text. I dare you on Tuesday with your smart device to be able to open that baby up and say, holy scriptures, come alive and speak to me. We got to be equipped in the word of God because the word of God is alive and true. And so that's one of my roles is to help equip you in the scriptures. A third is to be equipped in your faith to share it. Not just to have it, but to give it. Yeah. Oh, you come on Sunday and you get your faith boost, shot in the arm. I'm good. I'm ready for another 24 hours. Or I'm ready for another seven days. I'll see you next Sunday when I get another boost in the arm. Faith, back up, boosted. Here we go, back at it. Look, we get the faith to give the faith. We, we, we get this understanding, this knowledge, this truth in our lives to be able to share it. Instead of hold it, this is the one time in particular that you do not want to monopolize and just stay silent on the good news of what God's given you. It is, the good news is to evangel, is to, to spread, is to, to give it away. Some of you are already starting to freak out a little bit like, whoa, does that mean I have to be an evangelist? Maybe. If you have kids, those are your first disciples. Start evangelizing them. Let it be known. 
Heaven forbid that you have all these kids and all these wonderful gifts that God's given you, and then you never tell them about Jesus. See, we are to share the faith. Fourthly, and just a way that leaders can equip, is, is to be equipped to, to encourage I trust today that you're encouraged with the worship. You're encouraged with the hymns. You're encouraged in the backyard with an ice cream cone when someone comes alongside you. You're encouraged by being together. You're encouraged by sitting next to a friend. You're encouraged by being in the body of Christ. We've got to be growing in the equipping of encouragement. Because here's the thing. We are really good at being critical and judgmental. And it could be a whole lot better on this camp of being gracious and encouraging. Now, there's more, more, more where that's going to come. All right, so for the equipping of the saints is that first part. Uh, uh, and then there's the for the work of the ministry. We're all ministers with a variety of giftings and services. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about 12 different gifts. Could I challenge us to expand and blow up the paradigm that there's only 12? There are so many giftings, a variety of giftings that is a well, a robust, robust well, a treasure in this church and in so many other churches. And so part of this is for the work of the ministry is to see the varieties of those services, the varieties of those gifts, fan that flame to be pop, 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 coming alive. And that we're okay with different giftings and different things that are happening. Instead of, well, my bike's blue and I want it red. He can prophesy, but I wanted to. And we have these different things where we play the comparison game instead of just complimenting, man, God's speaking through you in that. Yes. And God's speaking through you. Yes. And that together we can be ministers with the variety of service gifts that he's given us through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, just a few verses earlier in Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 10, it says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, you got to catch that. It's according to not your skills, resume, strengths, backgrounds, 401Ks, savings accounts, or anything that you've done. It comes, friends, according to the measure of Christ's gift that he has given you the grace to be able to experience certain gifts. Now, there's a whole other sermon series around the gifts, but I'm just saying that the, for the work of the ministry is that we would be activated in the service and the spirit of the gifts that are made, made available, available to us. If you're sitting on your thumbs, if you're sitting on your gifts and you're not activated in your gifts, I'm calling you out. Come on, National Guard. It's time to just, let's go, report for duty. We got to be able to step up in the gifts that God's given and be able to share those so that he gets the glory and that the world is one for him. But when we just sit back and just like active reserve, sort of sometimes I'll just do it when everything works out and the weather's good. Well, that, that, that's not going to accomplish his purposes 1 Peter 4.10 says, as each has received a gift, use it, get ready for this, use that gift to serve one another. Oh, no. Why do I have to use the gift to serve somebody else? Can I use the gift for me? My new blue bike for me. My new drum sets for me. No. No. You got a gift like Jeff Hooten on the guitar? You don't just sit in your closet and just play Eric Clapton all day. You step up and you plug in and you play the hymns like, oh my goodness, for God's glory. A gift being shared with others. You see, he's given us gifts that we would serve with one another. Please let me just clarify that I'm not only speaking about stage gifts, instrument gifts. I'm talking about a variety of other gifts that God has bestowed and given upon so many of you. And I'm saying, commission you to start using them again, activate them again. Oh, I don't know how to use them. Well, that's part of my job is to help equip you to be able to know how to use the gifts, but try get on that bike. Even if it's with training wheels, start riding, unleash the saints to serve. Now, how can you even say that serve? I can say it because Jesus said it. Mark 10, 45, Jesus came to serve instead of being served. So this whole thesis, if you will, is joining Jesus and serving others. That is the solution. That is the answer. So how is your ministry? 
Are you joining Jesus and serving others? You're equipped to serve and others are being blessed because of that. Some to be thinking about this summer. Oh, no, no, I'm off on summer break. No, I got vacation. I'll check back in in fall. And finally, in the third part here we see of how this all goes is for the edifying or for the building up of the church. And Paul uses this construction kind of metaphor. And I, I don't do construction. I need a contractor to help me with construction. But when I hire a construction person or a contractor, and many of you have done this, when you have a project, you, let's say we're going to build a house. You want that house to be durable. You want it to be steady. You want it to be built so there's no decay. You want it to be functional. And you want it to be beautiful. This describes, I think, what the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ can be. It should be just like that. And does this describe your ministry? Does this describe the way that you live your life? Does it build up? Does it edify? Is it durable? Is it strong? Is it encouraging? Is it something that... Is not full of decay, but is helping others make it through the day. We, we got to find ways to edify and build up the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14 says, building up looks like this, to pursue love and earnestly desire the gifts. But not just the gifts of, I want to be a prophet, but more importantly, to desire the gift of love. If we could just love, we would be going so much further. <coughs> All right, we're wrapping it up. Verse 13, I'm going to bring us back to verse 13 because this gives us a little timetable. Check this out. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. When I read this, I think that that means it's probably not going to be until Jesus returns. So there's not a timetable in the sense that I've got to be fully mature. I've got to do all this work. I've got to make all this stuff happen this weekend. No, this will continue until we come into such unity in our faith, knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Let me just ask you a question. Please don't raise your hand. How many believe that you are completely up to the full measure, 100% standard of Jesus Christ? then we have more work to be done. We have more grace to receive. We have more to be able to be equipped in so that the work of the ministry can flourish and the body of Christ can be built up. Verse 14, then we will no longer be, be immature like children. I love this, for, this part. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with, with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Verse 15, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. That's back to the barbell. Look, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, yes, we need them. But Jesus ultimately is the barbell bodybuilder, lifter, giver of everything. He's the one. It says it right here. Who is the head of his body? Jesus. Who is the head of the church? It's not me. It's not us. It's not you. It's him. We must be reminded of this. This is us. And finally, verse 16, our last verse that we touched on earlier. He makes the whole body. How does this work? He makes the whole body. I cannot believe this is a, a, a solution. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, this seems like an impossible endeavor, but he makes the whole body fit together. He makes us fit together, but we do have a part to play as each part does its own special work, own special ministry, own special giftings, own special things that God's called us to. For this will help other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. All right. So what are the takeaways from this text? Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It's a lot in there. Christ gives gifts. Five gifts. Leaders. Those leaders are supposed to equip for the work of the ministry. To build up and do the edifying of the church. But what does this mean to me? What does it mean to us? 
if the first three chapters are about the calling of the church, and now we're getting into the third, four, five, and six chapters of the conduct of the church, how are we to, to apply this today? Let me just say it this way. What if this week, July 18th to the 24th, we read Ephesians each day and applied it? What if we sat down in our devotions and we, like tomorrow, for example, read Ephesians 1, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal some things, and then apply that in your life on Monday. Tuesday, Ephesians 2, read it and apply it. Ephesians 3 on Wednesday. Oh, Ephesians 3 is good. You want to skip to Ephesians 3, you can, but. And then Ephesians 4, we just read part of Ephesians 4, so good. Then Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, friends, it's all about how to walk in love, walk in the light, and walk in wisdom. Anybody need to know how to do that? Well, just skip to Ephesians 5. Just read Ephesians 5 every day this week. You create the hybrid of how you want to read it, but just start reading it. And that way we can then start applying it. Oh, I probably shouldn't leave out Ephesians 6. Oh, you want to wait till Saturday and read Ephesians 6. Guess what? There's armor. There's a spiritual battle that we're in, and God's given us a way to fight it. He's given us armor to wear, from boots to belts to breastplates to helmets. He's given us swords. He's given us shields. He's given us stuff to be able to know how to handle the fight. See, the thing is, we whine and kibitz and complain about what's happening on CNN and NBC and ABC and 123 and all the different channels. Instead of tuning into Ephesians 6, we just would say, look, put these things on and you'll then know how to handle whatever channel you're listening to. we got to be able to put on some stuff to help us to be able to fight the good fight. Uh, friends, this is just all in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So what if we read it this week? But one other caveat. What if you read it to apply it? What that looks like for me? When I read scripture, I open it up and I say, before I read it, where did God speak? Read it. He's speaking. And then I try to not take the whole text, but just like one part, one word, one phrase, one sentence and say, wow, what is it about that that I can observe in my life that's going on in my life that I can then apply in my life, not next month, but apply in my life today. You see, what I'm trying to communicate, friends, is you got to get personal with the word. You got to get personal so you can get practical. So what if you read more of Ephesians this week? All right, let me just really go off the, the, the deep end. What if you just read anything this week in the Bible? <clears throat> it's all good. I'm just trying to narrow the focus just a little bit for this summer week of Ephesians is good. Ephesians is so good. All right, and my, my second and, and possibly even more challenging application for us. Because the first what if is can you read the Bible and apply it? And some of us need to improve on that. But my second application is what if this week we speak the word with truth? Speak the truth in love. I mean, that's what Paul, he's talking about. Speak truth, how? With love. When you speak truth without love, Yes, it's truth, but it might hurt and it might be harmful. We've got to speak the word of, and the truth with love, with grace. This is how the church, this is how the body, this is how we're edified, this is how we're, we're built up. So let me ask you, does your speech build up or tear down? Does your speech edify and encourage or does it rip and shred and tear down? Some of you are like, well, how, 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 why well, he's starting to read my mail right now. I, how did he know about that conversation with my spouse last night? I don't know about your spouse relationships and stuff, but I know that the enemy of our soul wants to get in and divide. But what if we learn to speak the truth with love in the relationships that we have between husband and wife, between parents and children, between brothers and sisters? All right, I'm going to stretch it a little bit. I'm going to go beyond family. What if we speak the truth and love with our friends. (gasps) No, I might lose that friendship if I do that. What if we speak the truth and love even with strangers? Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out this next week and just start 
blasting people. But if you have relationship and you have equity, relational equity with somebody, and God would then reveal something to be able to speak it with love, maybe you'd step into that. But friends, I, I'm just wondering, as a body of believers that is learning to be equipped to be built up and edified, we could see more truth talkers, truth walkers, love extenders, grace givers. I'm not suggesting that we start going around just, ah, what you're doing, wrong. Oh, what you're, oh, what you're, and we just start blowing people up, all right? But what if we humbly come before each other and say, look, I, I, I'm working through this and it sounds like you're working through some stuff. How can I come alongside you and pray for you? How can I help you in this? Friends, we gotta get better about speaking the truth in love. But we also have to get better about receiving that truth when it's spoken. And, and there's that kind of back and forth that's involved there. But because we have the Holy Spirit who resides in each of us, we should be able to share it and we should be able to receive it. Now, some of you are starting to think, man, Greg, do you have like something you really want to say? I mean, is there something you're going to call me on this week? Are you going to email me on Tuesday with, yeah, that finally that thing I've been meaning to talk to you about? No, no, I don't have a specific thing. But God's going to possibly bring up something, reveal something to you. And I want to encourage you, in love, share it. But start first this way. Surrender to what that is for you before you go to somebody else. And ask the Holy Spirit to work that in and filter that and digest that and chew on that first with you. Because here's the good news. The Holy Spirit always goes before us. He can go before us without us. But if he wants to work something out in through us first, he could do that before you go to somebody else. All right, well, what if? Those are some pretty big time things. First one, get the word and apply it. Second one, this week, speak the word. Speak the truth in love. That might mean a confession. That might mean repentance. That might mean an apology. That might mean humility that we would be able to come before him, friends, because he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I wanna invite you to stand to your feet this morning as we wrap it up. Our prayer, prayer team and prayer room will be available. I trust today through the worship and the hymns and through this message, you've been encouraged and equipped emboldened to be able to walk out of here back into your life and your circumstances and your situation a whole lot less crusty and a whole lot more gracious a whole more a lot more tender to what God has for you because I realize that some of us are facing some big time things this week we got medical appointments we got businesses on the line we got kids in rebellion we got things that are right in front of us. It's like, I don't know. But let the Holy Spirit just download and downpour his overflow in you. Because that's what he does best. So don't resist him or his gifts, but embrace truth. And embrace the love that's available between brothers and sisters. Will we mess up? Will we stumble? Will we stub our toe? Will we hurt each other? Probably a little bit along the way. But we at Gateway, this is us, are learning to not be people that are offend, offended easily. I'm not gonna ask you to turn to the person next to you because I don't wanna, I mean, nonverbal things happen in there, but just silently right where you stand. Do you just agree without looking at them like, I'm gonna be less offendable to that person on my right. I'm not looking at him. I'm just gonna be less offendable with that person on my right. I'm not looking at the person on my left. I'm, I'm gonna be less offendable. That person up on stage, person behind me. Jesus, we come before you this morning. Some of us tired, some of us worn out, some of us burned out. But we come and we get away with you and you promise to recover our life. Show us how to take real rest. 
Walk with us, talk with us, work with us. We want to learn your unforced rhythms of grace. We lay down all of our heaviness. We want to keep company with you. We want to learn how to live freely, live lightly, live into your preferred destiny for us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be people that are edifying, equipping, working towards your good pleasure. And for my friends that are here today that possibly have never said yes to Jesus, if you've said yes to Jesus right now with your eyes closed and your heart open wide, would you join me in praying for those that you know, maybe a son or a daughter, a neighbor or a coworker, just pray for them as loud as a whisper by name. That this second half of this year, 2022, that there would be salvation, there would be reconciliation, there would be healing. Just begin to pray for that person that you know that comes to mind. That he would use you. And then for some of you that are today here watching online or you're right here in this room and you would like to accept Jesus as your personal savior. You'd like to say, Jesus, please take the barbell. Life's heavy and I need you to do the heavy lifting. I believe that you're the savior. I know that you went to the cross for me personally and I accept you into my life. I believe that you are the answer. So I give my heart, my life to you. I wanna start a journey with you. If that's you today, Please follow in our service at the Yes Wall. We have people that want to pray with you. Get a Bible in your hands. You're watching online, email or call us. We are here to serve, to come alongside you. Now I ask you to just lift up your heads and on the screen is going to be our benediction that you're going to help me with today. And this is my prayer out of Romans 15. Would you read this together with me, please? I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, he's available to you. So walk with him, talk with him. Have an incredible week. God bless you. You're dismissed.